in 1842, Michael Pillsbury will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right, the I was there. Chinese ceded <laughs> Hong Kong Island to the to British in perpetuity. In perpetuity means forever. It means you never have to give it back by treaty. A treaty the Chinese uh, regime at the time, Imperial China, greatly resented, and that resentment carried over through Republican China to Communist China to national, etc. Anyway, Hong Kong Island is a spectacular place if any of you have ever seen it, but it's disconnected. It's hard to maintain in and of itself. So in another period of Chinese weakness, the British negotiated another treaty in 1898, ceding the so-called New Territories, a big chunk of the mainland directly north of Hong Kong Island where Kowloon and a lot of other places are. This is very important because it allows for the material support of Hong Kong Island which then, which then rapidly over the course of the 20th century grew into at first the one of two business capitals of East Asia. It would vied with Tokyo since the Japanese um, property and, and, and market bubble burst in 89. I would say Hong Kong has been the undisputed business capital of the whole of East Asia. The problem from the British perspective is the new territories were not ceded in perpetuity but on a 99-year lease which expired in 1997. Uh, uh, by the 1970s, Hong Kong had become very important. Um, Britain's one of its very few remaining colonies and also an extremely successful colony. Britain wanted to hang on to it, went to the Chinese government and said, can we work out an extension or some kind of deal? The Chinese government. I, I wasn't there, but I can imagine their response. It was to give them a firm no and say, you can keep the island for as long as you want, but we're going to turn off the water and we're basically going to blockade the, case, the place and it's going to be useless to you forever. So it took the British about six years to adapt to this point and realize, yeah, we're going to have to give it back. And they opened negotiations in 1983 with China to come a, up with a way to hand Hong Kong back. Remember, they had to give back part of it. They didn't have to give back the most central part. But they came up with a deal to hand it back in 1987. Just as a personal aside, I happened to be there when this happened. I was in the harbor and I watched the ceremony, Chris Patton, Prince Charles, and you name it, right? Why is this important? This is something that was a thorn in the side of, of China as a civilization, not of one regime, not of the communist regime, of China for 150 years. It bothered them very greatly. They looked forward to the day when they could get it back. They were patient and they got it back without conflict without much of a struggle with just some gnashing of teeth and hair pulling and sighing and crying by the British but they got it back. A couple of quotes. Um, to win without fighting is best. Somebody may remember recognize these. And the second one is to destroy the enemy is not the acme of skill. To capture what you want from the enemy whether that's a city, a fortress, a ship, an army that is the acme of skill. Those are both from Sun Tzu a Chinese classic written about 200 BC. Um, this very well encapsulates the Chinese strategy, I would say, with regard to Hong Kong and with regard to Taiwan. Taiwan is a similar thorn in the, the psyche of China. This would, as, as, as Michael said, this would be the case no matter what the regime in Beijing were. It could be, you know, the neocons fantasy of a liberal democratic China and they would still really care about getting Taiwan back. It's central to the, the regime's conception of its territorial national integrity, right? And it has been since Taiwan, if, for those of you, I'm sure everybody in this room probably knows, I'll just give it a slight refresher. It has been uh, separate but not a nation since 1949. So we're going on more than 70 years at this point. Technically, it's not a state. It can't, it's not an independent nation. It cannot belong to the United Nations except it can only have observer status in certain international organizations for which statehood is a membership. And one very firm demand of the Chinese government on the international community is Taiwan can never be a full member of an international organization for which statehood is, is a member and, they, and as a requirement. And they make it very plain that they'll go to war over that. Okay? They're very, very clear about this. Now, the United States has a, a relationship with Taiwan, historical relationship. Why? Because the side in the Chinese Civil War that the United States backed in the 30s and, in the, and that with, the, with, with whom the United States worked during World War II to fight the Japanese and whom the United States supported after the defeat of Japan in 1945 when the Chinese Civil War uh, raged right back into its you know, full extent from 1945 to 1949, they lost the nationalists landed in Taiwan, took over Taiwan, formed a government in Taiwan, 
the government of Taiwan today is a successor of that regime that had been backed by the United States since at least the 30s, if not before that. You, can, you, can, I mean, you, could, you, you could draw it all the way back to Sun Yat-sen if you wanted to, but the formal relationship goes back to about the mid-30s. Um, the current status is a result of several political maneuverings that happened in the 1970s, beginning with the so-called opening to China that Nixon and Kissinger engineered, culminating in the visit, the first president first visit by a U.S. president to China in 1972, and, and really fundamentally solidifying in a change that Nixon did not foresee nor welcome, nor would he have, um, I mean, he was alive, but obviously didn't have a whole lot of influence in 1979, uh, would have opposed had he had a chance to stop it when the United States transferred its recognition of China to Beijing, kicked Taiwan off the Security Council, gave Beijing the seat on the Security Council in 79 under the Carter administration. As a as kind of retaliation or redress for that, I don't know how we would put it, the Congress passed the, the Taiwan Relations Act. Now this, I, I'm, I'm just bringing this up, this context here, which is not quite on the level, to put it mildly, of uh, an Article 5 guarantee in the NATO Charter, for instance, that is a treaty requirement that the United States has got to go to nuclear war in defense of a place, but it's, 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 it's a commitment of sorts the full extent of it and what it legally obligates us to is a bit ambiguous compared to an, you know, an actual mutual defense treaty signed by both sides. Um, this comes up a lot, especially lately, because we are told constantly that crisis is brewing in the Taiwan Straits. Um, China's been patient. Patience may be running out. Maybe they'll try to do something. So I just want to raise some questions for all of us to think about. Because it seems that lately um, this, I, I guess we could call it a kind of hawkishness that I think all three of us, all four of us up here, or five, agree on that, that has become, you know, there was a bipartisan consensus for a long time in Washington that um, China's not a threat. In fact, it's a giant business opportunity. It's, it's first and foremost a strategic partner against the USSR. Then it could be a strategic partner in various other areas of the world where we want geopolitical cooperation. And it's a, it's a potential uh, business partner, and it's become beyond a potential business partner. It's been a huge business partner for many, if not most, of, of giant American businesses. That was the bipartisan consensus for a long time. Don't rock the boat. In fact, let's play nice. Let's have state dinners. Let's pretend, you know. Um, Bill Clinton used the phrase strategic partner. George W. Bush subtly dug at Clinton during the 2000 campaign and changed that term to strategic competitor, right? And the idea was we have to shift toward a more adversarial stance without creating rhetoric that might lead to a new Cold War, except the actual practice of the Bush 43 administration over its eight years was essentially a continuation of st strategic partnership type actions. So the strategic competitor rhetoric was not acted upon. What we've seen now is a pretty dramatic shift toward, a, a still have a bipartisan consensus on China, but now it's a bipartisan con consensus to sort of beat up on them rhetorically. Not to take any actual action as far as I can see, except some of the things we talked about. But well, where that rhetoric leads is, you know, we're obligated to do something about Taiwan and it would be a stain on the national honor and so on and so forth. And so if something happens, we got to get into a fight. Um, people haven't, well, no one in actual politics has stated that quite so bluntly yet, unless I missed it, but a lot of people peripheral to actual politics or pretty close almost to the inner ring of actual politics are saying it. So it's something that I think we need to think about very carefully. Now, my own view is, getting back to the Sun Tzu quotes, China's preference is still to take Taiwan without fighting for it. Time is on their side, they believe, or used to believe. I, I leave it to the, the real, um, what's the, is there a Chinese term for Kremlinology? I don't know what it is, if so. Uh, uh, Sino-Kremlinologists to tell me what's really going on inside this, the halls of power and, and what the leadership is thinking, because some, some are saying, some people who claim to know are saying, oh no, 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 they're getting impatient and they're gonna, they're gonna do something shortly. I, I just have no basis to evaluate that. But based on historical precedent, I think the Chinese would certainly like to do exactly what they did with regard to Hong Kong. Tip the balance of strategic power, economic power, political power, so much against 
the possibility of continued Taiwanese independence, that public opinion in Taiwan comes to accept the notion that we just have to make the best deal we can make. And then you win without fighting, right? And you've captured without destroying two ideal outcomes of any kind of uh, transaction of this type uh, for China. I'll, a couple more quick points just to put into your minds as you think about this. I, I have been told, and I looked this up, and it seems right, I'm not an expert, so if somebody wants to fact check me later and say I got it wrong, I'm just going to admit that I got it wrong. But something like 92% of semiconductor production is now domiciled is in Taiwan. That's a fairly new trend. Remember S Silicon Valley, have you heard of it? It's a neighborhood in Northern California. Silicon's an element on the periodic table that you make into these chips. They actually used to make them there. They don't so much anymore. They make them in Taiwan. And that, that has been a deliberate strategy of the Taiwanese government coupled with the Taiwanese business community. And what it looks like to me and to others who watch this carefully is to, to make that island so indispensable to the global economy and global supply chains that any kind of crisis, whoever starts it and whatever the outcome is, will hurt everybody. So whoever you are, you want to invade our island? Do you depend on microchips? How is this going to work out in the long term? I don't know about you. I'll give you one little anecdote. We've all heard supply chain stories. Can't get this computer chip. Therefore, there's no cars on the lot and so on and so forth. I work in an office building with an air conditioning system. It's okay now, it's October, it's not so bad. But during the summer, the air conditioning didn't work and you'd have to teach a class for two hours, three hours, and you'd sweat very badly because it's Washington and I, why doesn't the air conditioning work? Well, we're waiting for a part, some kind of chip. I can't prove to you that it's from Taiwan. I don't know, it doesn't matter. The point is, everything runs on these chips now, not just your laptop, not just Google servers, everything. Your car, your fridge, your air conditioning, you name it. And it seems like to control 92% of that market is to be in a pretty good position, even if you're a nation of 24 million, with, you know, um, a nation of 24 million can only have so big a military, and especially against a nation of 1.4 billion, hard to say what you can do. You can make yourself, though, so indispensable as to cause others to think twice. And second to last point, I think, but this has already been brought up, the military balance of power in the strait has been increasingly Im uh, the china let me put it simply china has been building up 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 for a long time for decades and taiwan the taiwan american combination has not caught up either in terms of sheer numbers and certainly not in terms of technology so that's a way of winning without fighting if you have two or three decades to build up so much force on one side that the other side just looks at it and goes, I can't win that fight, then the fight doesn't happen unless the other side is delusional or crazy brave or something. And the last point I will raise, I just want you to think about this. I predict nothing, right? Does anybody know the last time? Well, you don't need to know because I'll tell you. The last time a United States aircraft carrier was sunk it was the Battle of Midway, the USS Yorktown, June of 1942. We haven't lost an aircraft. Actually, we did lose an aircraft carrier last year, not a fleet carrier, a smaller carrier. Do you know why? Because it burned in San Diego Harbor, and the Navy couldn't figure out how to put out the fire, and they had to scrap the ship. The USS Bonham Richard, look it up. The Navy crashed four ships in 2017. Read the official reports from the Department of the Navy and the congressional investigations on those crashes. They are marvels of esoteric writing to try to dodge the cause of what happened while somehow revealing it between the lines if you can sit there with an electron microscope and read it carefully and keep yourself awake, right? If you're Taiwan and you're counting on the United States to defend you, what conclusion did you draw from Afghanistan this summer? Did you get the conclusion that here is a great power that knows what it's doing, that keeps its promises, and that can execute the things that it wants to do, right? So getting back to the carrier point, I'll leave it at that. Forget that hypersonic missile. If you ask somebody who, 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 who watches the Navy and follows the Navy, all this based on open source material, I hasten to add, they will say, plausibly, if not certainly, the Chinese have had an ability to sink a fleet carrier for a last decade at least, right? A carrier goes out in a so-called battle group, has a number of ships ringing it and some attack submarines. All of those things are meant to protect the central asset, which is the aircraft carrier, which these days costs anywhere from 12 to 14 billion dollars. And with the wing, that is the, the planes and the people, the extra people on board, there's about 6,500 people on that aircraft carrier. 
So $14 billion and 6,500 people. Now, 2,800 people or so died on 9-11. And remember what a psychological shock and wound to the nation that was. Imagine 6,500 people in a military defeat over something that was foreseeable in advance and, and ask yourself how the nation would take it. I'm not trying to draw any conclusions about this, but I'm I just want to take you right back to what Peter Thiel said. Right now, there seems to be a massive amount of groupthink. We're only allowed to think about this one way. Nobody is allowed to bring up any of the counterfactuals or any, uh, you know, any other out, outlying considerations. And when policy is made on that basis, horrible blunders and catastrophes result. So before the United States commits itself to some policy, or before we, whoever we broadly understood as being in this room are, right of center, conservatives, intellectuals, nationalists, who want the best for our country, who want the best for our military, who want to maintain our alliance structure with credibility, but before we commit ourselves to a policy, are we in this room take a stand in favor of X or against Y and make recommendations that other people may read and listen to, we should be at least thinking about all of these considerations. And in my view, the conversation as it has, I don't mean this conversation, I mean the broad conversation on Taiwan has taken insufficient account of the things that I mentioned and, and, and others.